And uh, looking forward to this passage. It is our final one here in the New Testament, considering the rapture and things, but I think it is an extremely powerful one in the messages and the truth that it conveys. And so as you find 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let me also say, and I'm very uh, proud of our boys basketball team and finishing up as state runner-up yesterday, and uh, they've had a great season, as Dave alluded to, and uh, finished the conference undefeated, won that, and so we're so very proud of them. It's a difficult day as they only lost by one point yesterday, and so it was a tough game. But I also want to say that all that to say this, as a, as a coach, as a parent, as the administrator, uh, as the pastor, I sure am thankful for your support uh, of FBA and your support of the teams and things like that on behalf of Coach Loga and the boys. Uh, we are grateful for how many came out to cheer them on. Many of you didn't even have kids playing and things like that. And so I appreciate you doing so and maybe through live streaming and things. And so I just want to say thank you for coming up, showing up at games and cheering and yelling all that good thing. So thank you so very much for that. And uh, though they are hurting a little bit today, we're so very proud of these boys and uh, the effort they put forth. They did a great job. Thank you for your support in that way. All right, last time and last Sunday night, it was uh, exciting to get to a couple different passages. You remember real quick what we looked at, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, we learned three things. First of all, we understood that John wrote of the church being removed from, not protected in the midst of the 70th week or the tribulation. That was the first thing. Number two, here's uh, what else John wrote about. He wrote that the church being delivered from the entire period of time, the whole hour uh, that the trial will take place. Now, the rapture occurring before the entirety of the tribulation began. It's very key, very crucial to the timing of the tribulation as we understand it. Then number three, we understood this. John wrote of the church anticipating the imminent return of Christ, not the imminent occurrence of that trial. And along with the imminent return of Christ, he talked about rewards, your crowns and such. And so very much speaking of the church anticipating Christ's return first. Not the trial, not the punishment, the judgment, the wrath that would come with that trial. Then we turned our attention to 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Very quick review. Um, we understood that Paul reminded them the difference between darkness and light. And then he also talked about the wrath, the uh, contrast to the wrath and those who would be saved from the wrath. Then you remember we kind of looked at the Old Testament, not kind of, we did. We looked at several passages in Joel and Zephaniah, Amos, and, and understood that that is a common theme, the darkness and the light, the darkness of the day of the Lord. And so clearly Paul is referencing that and referring to that. And we looked at Revelation. We looked at multiple passages in Revelation that spoke about the day of the Lord being a day of wrath where Christ uh, his wrath, where the Lord's wrath is uh, unfurled on the earth at that time. And so um, in light of those statements, we came down to verse number nine, and we said the concluding as aspect is this, as children of light, our expectation, uh, expectation and appointment is not to wrath and darkness. Clearly, the statement of the verse is that, uh, that will come during the, the time of the tribulation, the time of that trial here on earth. We, in, in contrast, we are appointed unto salvation. And that is where our expectation is. And, and how, what, is the, what does that salvation look like? I love that verse 10 of this passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10. It says this, that salvation is you and I living together with him. I don't know about you, but there's no better description of heaven than I can find. It's simply this, we get to live together with Jesus Christ. That's heaven, friend. That's heaven. And so we look forward to that. And that is the promise here of even in the rapture. You're not, you're not appointed unto wrath, but you're appointed unto salvation. And that salvation is that you will be living with him. You will be together with Jesus Christ, the bride with the bridegroom. And then lastly, we looked at 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Paul committing to church at Thessalonica, he says, he commends them because their first and primary anticipation is that of Jesus Christ waiting for, as the verse says, for his son from heaven. That was their anticipation. First, primary, nothing else before. This was their anticipation. And so as we looked at those two verses, we came to the conclusion that God, again, has not appointed his church to face and endure the wrath to come, rather enjoyed the salvation found being together with Christ when the time of wrath befalls the earth. Now we want to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It builds on 1 Thessalonians. It's quite interesting in how these two letters go together. In fact, uh, if you study it, you will find out that many um, uh, theologians, commentators believe that 2 Thessalonians was actually written quickly after 1 Thessalonians. In fact, the thought is this, that some of the couriers or messengers that Paul had sent to the church at Thessalonica had come back. They would brought back a report that some things still weren't right in the church at Thessalonica. Some things weren't quite right. Uh, 
received as they should have been with the first letter or had been forgotten. We'll see that tonight. And so Paul writes this letter very much on the heels of the first letter. And so you will see that kind of play out tonight, even here at the beginning. Look at first, if we can, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Let's look at verse number 4, if you will, with me. Verse number 4. And as we look at it, I, I ask this question of you. Uh, what is the church there at Thessalonica enduring? Okay, so look at verse number 4. What are they enduring? Look at verse 4, we'll read it. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith, here it is, in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So let's put it into context. Thessalonians, are, are, uh, Thessalonians, those in Thessalonica, are experiencing great tribulation. They are going through persecution. And uh, it is heavy in many ways. We might say that it's uh, quite uh, intense. And so as they were going through these persecutions, as they were going through the tribulations uh, for their faith and such, it contributed to the church being fearful. Again, remember what was being dealt with in 1 Thessalonians. They were fearful that they had missed the rapture, that they were presently in the day of the Lord, that the tribulations, persecutions that they were experiencing were manifestation of the reality that the 70th week of Daniel had happened. The tribulation was now right here, and God's wrath was going to be poured out upon the earth in their midst, okay? Now, it, what's interesting, they received that first letter of 1 Thessalonians. We studied it. 1 Thessalonians 4 deals with the rapture exclusively and extensively. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 dealt a little bit, as we saw last week, with the day of the Lord. So they have just received this letter. They had received the truth and kind of understood it as Paul sent it to them. But here, the intensity of that tribulation they were under caused them to still entertain the thoughts that they had missed that rapture. That they were in the midst of the tribulation. You say, well, man, that's crazy. They had this letter from Paul. They had read it through. They'd understand what chapter 4 said. They'd understand what chapter 5. And Paul making them the delineation between the rapture and the day of the Lord, the tribulation to come. And so my, they were struggling. Well, there was another factor as to why they're struggling. Something else happened. And this is quite amazing because, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes complain about Google. And I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes complain about YouTube and all the false teachers and all the false prophets out there, right? And uh, we'll talk about how... If you want to find a doctrine of something, uh, you, you can find it. Uh, in fact, Brother Jim Bryson mentioned after the service some, something that somebody came up and said to him about a, a passage in the Scripture and kind of formed a doctrine off of it um, for the end times. And it made no sense whatsoever. Can I tell you right now, if you can dream up the doctrine, it's probably on YouTube. If you can dream it up, if you can think about it, if you can come up with some kind of false doctrine, false teaching, it's probably out there. Just Google it. Don't do that, actually. Uh, but it's probably on YouTube. It's on Facebook. It's on something on the World Wide Web. And so you can probably find it. Here's what's interesting to that correlation. I don't like having to struggle with that. Do you realize that Paul had to struggle with that? Paul fought that all the time, just like you and I did. Now, he didn't have the social media and everything else and the, the Internet and everything else to combat but there were still false teachers, false prophets doing things to attempt to lead people astray. And such is the case here. It's pretty interesting. Look with me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. Notice what Paul writes, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that, as that the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, is at Hand. Okay, now what do we see immediately in the passage? Number one, the first part says what? They were shaken in their minds. They were troubled in their hearts. And I, I like that. It kind of goes along with our verse for the month, right? Christ wants to give us peace. He doesn't want us to be troubled, nor does he want us to be afraid or fearful. Uh, he, he, Paul's writing, so listen, there's no reason to be shaken in your mind. Okay? An unstable mind, a, a kind of torn between thoughts. Well, I thought this was it, but I'm not sure, and so forth. Paul says, listen, I, I want to clarify some of that. I want to help you. You ought not to be shaken in your mind. You ought not to be troubled in your hearts. Okay? The persecution they were enduring played a part in this, but there was also something that they read that seemed to be um, from Paul. Now, it's interesting. Notice that little statement there. Nor by letter from Paul. Us. 
what seems to have happened, and many would agree, uh, uh, that this church had been given a letter. The letter was likely written by false teachers and false prophets, and they had sent it. And to add credence to what they were talking about, which appears to be this doctrine, that the day of the Lord was already here, the tribulation already happened, they had missed the rapture, it, to lend credence to that, it would seem that they signed Paul's name, or they signed the name of Timothy, or they signed the name of Silas, or they signed another apostle's name to this letter to make it seem like this is legit this is valid this is the teaching of one of the apostles or the paul himself or timothy or silas and so paul has to write this whoa, whoa, whoa. listen okay as you've been given the truth of god's word if anything comes along and and, and, and says different and i like what he says by spirit by word or by as a letter from us. Can I just tell you what I call those false prophets? Those are sneaky guys, right? Man, if they're writing a letter and they're signing Paul's name to it, they're, they're trying to deceive this church, and Satan loves it. They're doing just what we have faced on the, the, the internet and YouTube and all that. False prophets trying to push something as legitimate, trying to say, oh, this is, this is the truth, this is right. And so here he is trying to combat that reality. As they had produced this letter, and I, you see the statement, that word, uh, the use of the word us. So we don't know who, who they had signed. Maybe they had signed it from several of them, right? <laughs> Saul and Timothy, and, or excuse me, Paul and Timothy, and uh, maybe through Peter's name on there. Who knows? But they had tried to, to kind of support their false doctrine by presenting a letter to them. So Paul's writing them and saying, listen, this is not the case. This could not happen. It's impossible here in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, he's likely very dismayed, as you can imagine. He's probably very disappointed because why? They had, they had left the truth that he had already sent them. That first letter, they had kind of forgotten it already. And so now he has to turn around and give them some stronger evidence, some more evidence, shall we say. And I really appreciate the tone and tenor of this letter. I want you to see it tonight. As Paul writes this letter, and he's, he's probably frustrated. He's a little bit disappointed, dismayed that the first letter did not resonate long enough. They didn't hang on to it. They didn't hold to the truth. And now they're still struggling. And, but I like the tone and tenor of this. Don't miss it. See, he doesn't come across sensational as he presents eschatology. Too often today, it's all about the sensationalism of eschatology. And uh, we see advertisements for it and all kinds of things. People try to sensationalize eschatology. That's not how he comes across. In fact, his approach to them is very practical. He is presenting it with the heart of a pastor. And I love that. You know, uh, we have not covered the end times and prophetical times very much. Part of that is because my heart as a pastor is, listen, I don't want to be a sensationalist. I just want to encourage you and provide you with the comfort that God's word can be about what's coming up. That's Paul's heart right here. He's saying, listen, I, I want to comfort some confused Christians by giving you the practical evidence of the truth. Now, that also tells us something. There's a reason that here in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, we don't have the entirety of the end times spelled out. He doesn't go through a whole timeline of what's happening. He doesn't speak to every single event that occurs within that. That's, that, that's not what he does here. In fact, uh, we might say it's somewhat the opposite in this. He, he just is uh, confronting and addressing, correcting what is wrong in their thinking. So he's going to bring up some evidence. He's going to show some things to show them the errors in what they've received, the errors in what they have believed, and he corrects it tenderly in order that he may return unto them the joy and the hope and the peace of the truth that they have in Jesus Christ. In his imminent return and what that means for them. And so look at verse number two, if you will. He says something interesting here. Verse one, excuse me. Now we beseech you, brethren. He's pleading with them. He's encouraging them, imploring them, requesting them to cling to the truths found in this chapter. All right. So what are the truths that he presents concerning the rapture and therefore the day of the Lord, the tribulation, to delineate, wait a minute, you're not here yet. This still has to happen, and it will happen before this happens. Here's what he presents. Look at verse 3, if you will, with me. Let no man deceive you by any means. Okay, so we understand. He understands. They're trying to deceive you. Don't let them do so, verse number 2. Then he goes on with this. For that day shall not come, and speaking of the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, for that day shall not come, except the, there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed that son or the son of perdition. Okay, first thing we get, Second Thessalonians chapter two, is this: there has to be a falling away. 
the term departure before the day of the Lord can take place. That Greek word there, many of you will know, that's the word from which we get our word apostasy. Apostasy, uh, typically referring to heresy, something that deviates from the truth, it departs from. And that is the basic meaning of this Greek word, though, is just to depart. It doesn't necessarily have the connotation always of uh, doctrine or whatever, though sometimes it certainly does, okay? So that begs the question. I know we're going quick, but it's a great passage, right? So here's the question. If something's going to fall away, if something is going to depart from something, we need to say who's departing and what are they departing from? Who is departing and what are they departing from? There's somewhat of a, uh, a debate or some views based on or about this passage as to who is, being, uh, who is de- doing the departing and what is being departed from. Uh, the first, as many of us have heard, that falling away is a departure from sound doctrine and teaching. That is consistent, certainly, with the word apostasy, though in its root, it just basically means to depart. So it's a departure from sound doctrine and teaching. In other words, a departure from the Word of God. Can I ask you right now, is there any departure from the Word of God in the world today? <laughs> you better believe it, right? We see it today. It's out there in uh, so-called religions in many ways. There's a departure from that. But there's also, as he is alluding to, before this happens, there's going to be another departure, and we've seen it already. That could be the departure of the saints of the earth, the believers Uh, The church of Jesus Christ, the departure of the saints, the believers, and so forth. In fact, it's pretty consistent with what he writes in verse 1. Look at verse 1 of the same chapter. Okay, chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. I love that. He starts right out. He says, listen, okay, we're going to beseech you. I want to implore you about this topic. It's the coming of Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. And then he speaks just a couple verses later. There's going to be a falling away. Yea, there's going to be a departure, a departure uh, happening here, okay? So what do we know? Well, I think that the passage is open in what it refers to in this sense. It simply could be possible that it's speaking of both departures. The church will certainly have departed first before the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed, as it describes him here, the Antichrist. I also believe, as we have experienced even today and we're in the midst of, there will be a a greater departure from sound doctrine, true biblical teaching. Why? Because then it leaves the world wide open for the Antichrist to come in and teach and preach false doctrine and false teaching. It leaves the world wide open. There's a, there's a falling away from the scriptures, a neglect of the Bible that, that is going to be present that then opens the door wide open for people to follow some fake, don't miss it, some fake Savior. How have we said it before? How, what's the best way to expose and recognize a counterfeit? Know the real thing. Know the real thing. And so in order to identify the Antichrist as such, in order to identify that this is a false Christ, a false Savior, uh, you have to know the real thing. Well, there's going to be a falling away of sound doctrine, true biblical teaching to identify, wait a minute, this isn't the real Christ, this isn't Jesus Christ, this isn't the Savior that the Bible speaks of. Departure from that. To be honest to the text, I, uh, it does not say specifically what is departed from, so both options in a sense are on the table with both we know happening as we get closer and that day of the lord uh, soon comes the tribulation and stuff things both will happen now here's what's ironic about this whole passage too in some sense paul is combating the very same thing that he says is going to happen okay so he says and again we may lean towards saying well there's going to be a falling away from sound doctrine and uh, teaching that's what the, that that verse alludes to maybe we may say no i think it's a departure of the saints going uh, to heaven that rapture that he alludes to in verse one could be could be both of them that he's alluding to but if paul is indeed as we know other passages are saying that in the end times there's going to be a falling away from sound doctrine true biblical teaching What's interesting about that is Paul is already dealing with it, isn't he? Look at verse number 5 in the passage. Notice what he says, verse number 5 of chapter 2. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Isn't that a great statement? You understand what he's saying to him? He says, don't you remember? I've already preached this. I've already been with you. I preached it. I've told you. And, uh, I, and I even alluded to it in my last letter. I've repeated this. I preached it in your midst when I was yet with you. 
Why don't you remember these things? Why have you so soon forgotten, or using the term he uses in the passage, why have you departed from the truth already? Why have you been so easily led astray? Why are you believing that the rapture has already happened and the day of the Lord is transpiring right now? Why have you departed from it? It's a little rebuke of the believers found in this one passage. One other thing we want to note, too, within the passage as we see it play out is that these early believers well understood that there would be an antichrist appear on earth. The physical, tangible embodiment of the spirit of the Antichrist, the scriptures warn of, uh, of wickedness and lawlessness, it, it presented, and, and Paul presents it in such a way that they already know of this Antichrist and his future appearance. John would speak of it too. He wrote to the believers and he said this. He said, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many antichrists. There's many of those who are subscribing to the spirit of the antichrist, as the Bible describes it. There are those who are anti-God and anti-Jesus Christ, and they're, they're trying to spread wickedness and lawlessness. And he says, whereby we know that it is the last time. We're, we're there on the cusp. We're there on the threshold of the day of the Lord. We're coming near. It's the last age, and that, that word time is literally hour. So we're at the last hour, the 11th hour. Uh, uh, in reality, and I love the statement here, as ye have heard that Antichrist will come. It was common knowledge. They knew that the Christ himself had spoken of it, Matthew chapter 24. The Old Testament prophesies, in fact, we'll get into it in the tribulation. Daniel has a whole lot to say about the Antichrist. And the prophecies concerning what he will do and the abomination of a, a desolation and so forth. All these things about the Antichrist prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ repeats them in the New Testament, Matthew 24 and other passages. And now Paul's saying, listen, you know about this. John says, hey, you know about the Antichrist that he will appear. This son of perdition, this man of iniquity, this man of sin. He is coming and they were well aware of that truth. Now understanding that his arrival someday in the day of the Lord in the tribulation was common knowledge. Uh, the thought of him being revealed, verse 3, he's going to be revealed, that man of sin revealed, that son of perdition revealed, manifested worldwide. We kind of want to build on that because Paul makes a significant point in verse number 6. Look at verse number 6. Notice what he says. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Okay, now that's, a, that's an interesting statement that he makes here. Here's what he's saying. Something is keeping that man, the Antichrist, from bursting onto the scene. Something is withholding that moment of his revelation here on earth as part of the day of the Lord. And what's interesting about this verse is here's what he says. Did you catch the first part? Paul, Paul makes this point. You know what that is. You believers there in Thessalonica, I've taught you before, as verse 5 says, don't you remember these things? I preached them in your midst, and I've wrote about them before. You know these things, as now ye know. They had knowledge of the power that is holding back the worldwide revelation of the Antichrist. Look at verse 7, he begins to develop the thought. Verse 7, just the first part. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. All right. Here's the next point that he's making, okay? The, the mystery of iniquity, in fact, we'll, we'll boil it down to three points out of verse 7 and, and the surrounding verses is this. The mystery of iniquity doth already work in his day and still works today. The mystery of iniquity doth already work in his day and still works today. Literally speaking of the spirit of the Antichrist. It has been and, and is at work. It's been working ever since the Garden of Eden, we could say. Anytime that we see anti-God, anti-Christ uh, pushing a false doctrine, false teaching, and so forth, discrediting what the Bible says, the Word of God, and the Gospel, it is the spirit of the Antichrist. It's been at work. It's the lawlessness that is in revolt and rebellion against God in this world right now. It was lawlessness and rebellion in Noah's day, lawlessness and rebellion in Abraham's day, and you could follow all the way through. Israel, the very nation of God there was lawlessness there was rebellion there was revolt against the authority of God in that theocracy all through human ages there has been the spirit of antichrist at work against God but something is holding it back 
something and is not allowing it to burst open wide, letting the, uh, the floodgates wide open. Something's holding it back. I love what the passage in John says. John says this about the spirit of Antichrist. Hereby we know, or know ye, the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is who he is, is come as the flesh, or in the flesh, is not of God. Notice it. What did it identify it as? And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Where have you heard that it should come, he will come. The Antichrist will come. It will burst upon the scene. In the tribulation, there will be such an anti-God, rebellious revolt against God. One of the things that always sticks in my mind, you realize there will be people on earth who are watching people die around them when the wrath of God is unfurled, and they're shaking their fist at the God of heaven. Can I tell you, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. That is someone who has refused to understand and grasp who God is, who Jesus Christ is. If they can stand in the midst of wrath and judgment and condemnation, and they can shake their very fist at God instead of bowing the knee to Jesus Christ the Savior. And my friend, that is the spirit of the Antichrist. And he says, listen, it should come. It is coming. Even now, it's already in the world. This spirit of iniquity, this, as Paul would put it here, this reality of this iniquity is already here. The mystery of iniquity, this spirit of the Antichrist is already here and already at work. Wickedness, evil, immorality, false religions today are all Antichrist. They permeate the world. They grow seemingly more widespread with each generation. And as the mankind progressive, it was active in Paul's day. It's active here in our day. But understand this. It's being held back. That's what the verse says. It's being held back. And now you know what withholdeth, holds back. What withholdeth that. Right now, what's happening, this, this mystery of iniquity and so forth. Then he goes on and he'll say something else and we'll read it here. But let's look at the point first. Secondly, there is one that letteth. There is one that letteth right now. That means he is holding back. It's the same Greek word as, uh, as withholdeth uh, in verse 6. We find in verse 7, right? He withholdeth. He is holding back. Simply stated, he is restraining the mystery of iniquity from reaching its full manifestation. Its full revelation, we could say, being revealed, right? We understand that. Look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. Until he be taken out of the way, okay? So he that now letteth, okay, and that's a great word, it means to withhold. Same, same Greek word we found in verse 6. So withholding, to hold back, to, to restrain is the, the picture here. Now, that force isn't some human force. The human force cannot hold back Satan. You and I are incapable of holding back, and uh, we are incapable of doing so. It can only be the power of God at work today. And I like how one commentator has described the, the scene of that playing out. Let me read this for you. I think it was a great description. It's concerning the passage of verses 6 and 7. Here's what he wrote. This is the sense of the entire passage, it seems to be. He writes this. Satan, while perfectly aware of the fact that he cannot himself become incarnate, nevertheless would like to imitate the second person of the Trinity also in respect as far as possible. He yearns for a man over whom he will have complete control, who will perform his will as thoroughly as Jesus performed the will of the Father. It will have to be a man of outstanding talents. But as yet, the devil is being frustrated in his attempt to put his plan into operation. Someone, something is always holding back the deceiver's man of lawlessness. This, of course, happens under God's direction and power. Hence, for the time being, the, uh, the time being, excuse me, the worst Satan can do is to promote a spirit of lawlessness, that rejection of God. But this does not satisfy him. It is as if he and his man of sin bide their time. At the divinely decreed moment, the appropriate season, as the scripture might put it, when as a punishment for man's willingness to cooperate with that spirit, that someone, something that now holds back is removed. Satan will be able to carry out his plan. That's a great picture of what's transpiring even now. Something's holding back. So that certainly begs the question, 
What's this power of God that is holding back the full unleashing of the lawlessness which the Antichrist will usher in? The full manifestation of the spirit of the Antichrist, kind of the floodgates being opened in. Well, I'll have you turn and look at verse 6, would you? And then compare it with verse 7, particularly the pronouns. Verse 6, he says, and now you know what withholdeth, or that which withholdeth, okay? What withholdeth? And then verse 7, he's t- he kind of changes. Paul kind of elaborates. He kind of gives you a little hint. He kind of says, okay, let, let me clue you in, because you already know this, who it is. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let. He changes to a masculine use of a pronoun. Why? Why does he do so? Because he's alluding to the reality of who it is. You see, Paul is now referring to a person, and that person is the person of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Ghost, the power of God, God himself holding back, saying, no, 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 Satan, not yet. It's not time for the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, the man of perdition to be revealed. Uh, We're holding back, holding back, not quite yet, not time. He's holding it back. In fact, the Bible tells us the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is such. John chapter 16. Hold your spot here. Turn with me to John chapter 16, if you will, quickly. John chapter 16. Would you see with me the ministry of the Holy Spirit? John chapter 16. We'll come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in just a moment. But John chapter 16, would you look there? Specifically, verses 8 through 11. We have a great description of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, great night to take notes go back and kind of review we're going quick and uh, we'll continue to do so but i hope it's challenging and encouraging to you this is a great passage great truth uh, great um, solidifying evidence of the rapture when it occurs look at verse 8 notice what the uh, the the ministry of the holy spirit is and when he has come jesus christ speaking of the holy spirit third person of the the trinity he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. It is a great description. What do we see laid out for us? Well, the Holy Spirit in this world right now is condemning and confronting the world in the areas of sin and righteousness and judgment. As those verses describe, he's at work. He's holding back. He's saying, no, 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 that mystery of iniquity, that, that spirit of the law uh, uh, of the Antichrist, we don't want it. It's not good. And so he's kind of holding it back from taking over, if we could put it that way, describe it as such. Now, If he's doing so, if the Holy Spirit is what we would describe here as the great restrainer in the world at this time, what's been his chosen instrument? How has the Holy Spirit chosen to work, to restrain? What is the tool that he has picked up and said, listen, this is how I'm going to hold it back. This is what I'm going to use in the world today to restrain him. Can I tell you right now what Paul is alluding to here is simply this. His chosen instrument of restraint, you know what it is? The church. You and me. Why? Because who are we? We are the very body of Christ. We have been baptized into the Holy Spirit, and we are what? The holy temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost, you and I. We, the church, are the very instrument, the body, the arms, and the legs of of Christ. And what I love about that truth, that is it's the Christ church through which the Holy Spirit works to hold back, to restrain the flood of lawlessness that threatens to overthrow the world. It will be embodied eventually in the Antichrist. But that is consistent with how God and the Holy Spirit have operated in history too. God, down through the ages of mankind, have chosen his people, his followers, those who are loyal to him, to be his instrument to thwart and hold back the wickedness of this world. In every situation, in every time, in every age of mankind, there have been prophets, there have been believers, there have been followers of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it was the entire nation of Israel that God was using as his instrument to hold back that, that, the, that mystery of iniquity, as Paul puts it here. The spirit of the Antichrist, of lawlessness, revolt and rebel against God. Throughout the history of mankind, God has always used his people to thwart it. To hold it back, to restrain it. May I just tell you right now, as a, as a citizen of the United States of America, I can guarantee you, and I believe historically I can show you, how God has used his church to keep wickedness back in America. 
I really believe that. I, I honestly, historically, we can show that based upon principles and things that our country was founded upon. And I believe in the world at large that has happened and transpired in other nations and other places. But I'm telling you, my friend, it is the Holy Spirit that does it through his church. It is the Holy Spirit that restrains and holds back so that they say, no, nope, no, nope, Satan, this is, it's not time for you to take over, in a sense, the world and allow this lawlessness and revolt and rebellion against God to spread over everything. So in order for the Antichrist to arrive on the scene, Paul says something has to happen. Right now, it can't continue as it is. Something has to change. Something has to be different because right now, the Holy Spirit is using his instrument, his chosen instrument, the church to hold it all back, to withhold it, to restrain it. So what's going to change? Look back at verse 7, the last part, and we see what changes. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's here. Only he who now letteth will let, that's the Holy Spirit, until he is taken out of the way now wait a minute that begs a good question because you and i both understand that the holy spirit he he's part of the godhead he is god himself okay let's understand number three real quick and then we will um, uh, talk about that in a moment thirdly the restraining force will be removed it opens the door for the man of sin to be revealed going back to verse three okay so the restraining force is removed now going back to that thought wait a minute the holy spirit is, is god himself he is omnipresent so what is this referring to? He's not going anywhere in one sense, and obviously because of his omnipresence. Likewise, we also know that the Holy Spirit will be here during the tribulation. How do we know that? There will be people who are saved during the tribulation. Well, who does the regenerative work of salvation? John chapter 3 tells us that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He has part in regeneration and salvation. So he's going to be here. There's going to be people who are convinced and convicted. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts uh, of their need of Jesus Christ. That, that, that they should have trusted in him or, or now they have the opportunity to do so in the tribulation. And so he'll be there working. So what is this referring to that taken out of the way? Well, therefore, the reference removal has not to do with the, his presence, the Holy Spirit's presence here on earth but with his work in the instrument of that work here on earth. The work of restraining. That's why Paul's speaking of it here. Remember, we said he's trying to comfort some believers, some, some confused believers. These, these guys are messed up. They didn't adhere to everything he said in the first letter, everything he preached. They're struggling. Do we miss the rapture? Are we in the day of the Lord? So he's not talking about the entire prophetical timeline. He's just saying, let me clarify some things. Let me clear up some things. First of all, I want you to understand this. There's going to be a falling away. There's going to be a falling away. You've got to understand there's going to be a falling away from sound doctrine, yes, but also a, a departing of saints. That's going to happen. Number two, there, there's something holding back right now, folks. That, church, listen, there's somebody holding. You know who it is. You know it's the Holy Spirit. He's holding back. He, he's restraining this lawlessness and this spirit of the Antichrist. But, friend, that God has, is going to remove that. He's going to pull that out. He's going to take that restraining force out, and that is in the form of the Holy Spirit in the church, the indwelt members of the body of Christ. The church is removed, and now <laughs> the floodgates of hell, may we say, are unleashed on this world. It will spread like craziness, and the Antichrist will raise up, and we'll see in the tribulation, as he starts uh, the tribulation, he sounds wonderful, but then, boy, they see who he really is halfway through. <laughs> nation of israel does and the rest of the world and and we see that they, he is not the savior he's not the christ they their eyes are open to this false teaching false reality this lawlessness and in the oh what a time that will be so paul's connecting the dots for us what are those dots let me put them succinctly here it's this number one the holy spirit is the restrainer he's active in the ministry of restraining even right now you know what i say to that amen and hallelujah Man, I sure am thankful the Holy Spirit is at work restraining lawlessness today. Amen? Do you imagine how bad it could be if the Holy Spirit wasn't doing that? Through his church, through his people, he's doing it. Remember, the church isn't buildings. The church is people. 
So he's working through God's people to restrain it, to kind of hold it back. And hallelujah, he is. And he's convicting the world of sin and judgment and righteousness. That's his job. That's his ministry. John 16, Jesus Christ said it. So he's working as the great restrainer. Number two, here's what we see. The church, as his chosen instrument for this doing of this work, ever since the establishment of the church, day of Pentecost, uh, as such, initiating the permanent indwelling of the New Testament saints. So he's working through his church. That's the restraining instrument, the body of Christ being used in such a way. The number three, the Antichrist will only and can only be revealed according to 2 Thessalonians in verse 7. Only when the restraining ministry and instrument of the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. And my friend, that is the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. He's removed. It's removed. And so you and I, man, what a promise. Paul says, listen, don't worry. Don't fret. I beseech you. And I, I want your joy back. I want your hope back. I want your peace back. Don't let false teachers, false prophets steal it, signing a letter with my name. Don't let that happen. Here's the truth. Here's what's going to happen. And as we tie it together, uh, Paul is saying, be assured you didn't miss anything. You aren't sitting in the midst of the tribulation. You have no reason to be worried. The rapture must take place before the Antichrist is revealed or manifested for the whole world. And I like what verse 8 says. You see it there? Then shall the wicked be revealed. When that restraining force is removed, is taken out, then shall the wicked be restrained. Now, that begs a good question. Well, Pastor Henry, we've talked about mid-trib and so forth. Could that be halfway where they understand what he's really like when he goes back on the halfway covenant? No, because you know what Daniel tells us? In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, we are told that he arrives on the scene at the beginning of the tribulation where he establishes that seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. So the Antichrist bursts on the scene at the beginning of the tribulation. Listen, he is revealed as the man of sin. He is revealed to worldwide. And he does so when he establishes that peace agreement, that peace of covenant for the entirety of the 70th week of Daniel, the entirety of the tribulations, which means he's revealed at the beginning of the tribulation, which according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 can only happen his revealing after the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And my friend, can I tell you, I sure am thankful sir, for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is a powerful passage which establishes you and I knowing, okay, rapture's coming. Then after that, you and I can have a heaven-side seat to see what happens here. We aren't going to be it. We aren't going to go through it. We don't have to endure it. Our God is going to take us out of this place. And to that, I say amen and amen. Even